Welcome to the Invested Teacher Podcast with Cal Pierce, Matt Bigley, and uh, myself, John Orr. Get ready to be taught as we share our successes and failures encountered during our real life lessons, learning how to build generational wealth from the ground up. Welcome, invested students, to another episode of the Invested Teacher Podcast, and uh, we're we're continuing our creative mind. We're, we're tapping into Kyle's creative genius on on thinking about scenarios uh, and and different ways to kind of be creative so that you can create your. Uh, your wealth and, and build your financial future. In the last episode, Kyle, we were chatting about this kind of scenario that we were we were chatting with a, a client of ours and they were trying to come up with a way to kind of build their seed money or, or thinking about how they could access more capital. Um, and we talked about this idea that they had um, a relative, a parent, uh, a family member who was leaving money to them anyway and they looked at their at that kind of succession planning in a sense um, of, of kind of distributing some of that now in, in, a, in, in one particular way. And we're going to talk more about that same idea of how can we, how can we think about this succession planning and, and, and passing off some of uh, you know, your inheritance earlier to start generating a machine of wealth building earlier. Um, in that episode, uh, the scenario we looked at or, or the option we looked at was that, uh, that that family member who might be leaving you some money down the line anyway, could potentially uh, be your mortgage holder. So it was like maybe you had a, a certain amount of mortgage left on your on your own personal residence mortgage, and they had some money that they have access to and are really just looking for uh, maybe some income and a win-win scenario here to help help this build a, a machine or uh, for you to start having more access to capital was that they could you know lend you the money to pay off your mortgage and then now you're paying that family member back interest payments or maybe you're paying principal and interest payments but essentially could free up some of your uh, some of your personal kind of money you're putting towards mortgage to start you know building towards uh, your financial future in different ways, but it gave you some options to think, hey, it's a win-win because the family member is getting what they want. They want this regular income coming in off their investment, and they're they're using you as an investment. Yeah, I love it. And you know, when you really think about it too, I, I want people to kind of just reflect and think about maybe their own experiences. And first of all, uh, I just want to mention, um, John, do you think that Matt just doesn't like being creative? Because once again, like we're we're here solo without. Matt, hey, he's but, busy. Uh, he he's a busy guy, and uh, we were lucky. Sure we're is. lucky when he joins us to in, give us his insight. He is uh, he is out there on, on uh, you know walking the beat on the real estate game. Yeah. So he's uh, he's actively getting deals done and and uh, finding new deals. So uh, uh, we're we're slugging along here talking about uh, you know real estate investing and investing options in in particular but he he's got he's got a lot of work to do yeah and and we're we're just kidding around here because actually we send him out and he actually walked through a property on friday uh which we are looking at and vetting an off-market uh potential deal so he is overturning the stones while you and i get to sit here and just think in the abstract and be creative together while he's doing all the physical labor out there. So mm. go get him there, Matt. Uh, but I, why, I, why Matt just popped into my mind was, you know, he often talked in the early episodes about his experience and his sort of like upbringing around money. And I know you've spoken to it as well. And I've spoken to mine. Um, and, you know, there's some interesting, interesting things that happen when you actually look at those families who have wealth and those who are, we'll just call them like either middle class or maybe even lower class, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, in, in terms of, um, in terms of wealth building and generation. And, you know, I think there's something around our mindset that keeps us from thinking creatively like we have in the previous episode. 
and in this episode here today. So I just want to call it out right away okay. that the reality is, is that we are all better together and working together. So this is all about win-win scenarios for everyone involved in the family to grow the family wealth, not just to be selfish. So, you know, the thing that I worried about after um, reflecting on that first episode was like, I don't want people walking away from that episode thinking about like, are we just going to go and like, you know, ask our parents, you know, to like give us a free lunch, you know, and a free ticket. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. That is not what this is about. It's about ensuring that you're helping them to get more of what they want and need and also helping you and your family get more of what they want to need. And that's going to be different in every single household. So you have to think about that. And obviously, you know, these conversations can be challenging to have um, because I'll tell you what, like my, my parents and, and uh, my wife's parents, like we're a very close family unit. And, you know, by all means, we want to make sure that everybody is winning in this scenario. And we do not want to make it look as though you're just trying to win and you're trying to, you know, give them less returns or whatever it might be. So you have to just be cautious with that. Make sure that you understand what their financial wants and needs are and think about the things that you're after and how can you make sure that everybody comes together. And really, John, I only started thinking along this path after we were we're having successful creative joint venture deals Mm -hmm. that we had done in the past. It was like, oh my gosh, I finally had this epiphany that really it's less about who wins. I used to always think about like winning in the deal, like we got a great deal. Right. But when you soon to like, if you actually like think about the other person, if you think about the seller or the buyer, depending on the scenario you're in, if you think of the other person, the other party, you think about how do I help them win And can I still win too? As soon as you do that, then you are now in a position where it's almost impossible for the deal not to work. Because if you can help them get what they want, what they need, and you get what you want and you need, then everyone is great. And that's really a kind of a lesson in scarcity and abundance. And so if you think about it from a family perspective, you can do things in a way where you as a family unit can work together instead of everybody working independently. And, you know, I'm going to call out, I hope this isn't, you know, going to be culturally offensive to anyone here, but I'm going to say that like North Americans, like those who have been here multiple generations and, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll say like I, my family heritage is is mostly English, Scottish, Irish. Um, I don't know if it's just there, uh, but I see that here in North America, we tend to do this sort of like everyone's on their own. Like the kids got to get out of the house. Like we always joke, like get the kids out at 18. You got to go and like make a living for yourself. But yet you'll see other families from different areas of the world Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who tend to work together. They purchase properties as a family. They come to, and it's like, they're trying to make sure that everyone benefits there. And when you really think about that mindset, that is the mindset that leads to wealth generation. When you try to take on the world by yourself, self, you're actually really fighting an uphill battle. So be creative in it. And really, I think in this episode, John, we're hoping to take what we talked about in the last episode right. and almost like push that envelope even further. Like I would say that that first episode, some people hopefully had some epiphanies and went like, huh, that's interesting. Well, let's talk about how we can get even more creative mm-hmm. and ensure that everybody wins. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because, you know, when we, when we reflect back on that conversation and I think when if you have not yet gone back and listened to the previous episode on episode 18 on being creative to create wealth, uh, part one, head on over back there and, and give that one a listen. It'll set you up for some some ideas on on what we're really referencing here, but also how we're going to kind of frame out the rest of this this episode. Um, but, uh, but I think when Tom, remember it was Tom, Kyle, Tom came, uh, Tom was the one that we were chatting with their relative came to them, you know, they came to them saying like, I have some money, you know, I'm not sure exactly what to do with this pot of money or am I doing the right thing here? Like it was because Tom was trusted, a trusted family member to say like, I value your thoughts on where we can strengthen the family, you know, money up. And I think it was like that. That mindset was already there, I think, in the in in terms of Tom and his family. Um, but you're right; like we definitely should uh, mention that uh, this don't just run out and go, "Hey, these guys said, you know, 
you you sh- you should really consider this because uh, some parents might not be you know as as welcoming as say Tom's Tom's parents there in that scenario. So yeah, Kyle, in this in this episode we're going to extend uh, like almost this. Uh, almost the same idea that we've got this family member who is looking to kind of um, looking to like strengthen the family wealth building system up, but at the same time, you know, getting a, a win for them and a win for the family. So, so picture the scenario is still um, your family member is coming to you and saying like, look, I, I have some, you know, this is my retirement money or this is my, my money that I've, I've got access to it's ge- you know it's generating me an income here based off you know i have to pull this money out every every month or every year or maybe i've come into some access i've got this kind of pot of money that i'm not sure exactly what to do with to maximize my return um and we talked about kind of using that to fund a uh, a mortgage uh pass that to the to a family member to fund their mortgage uh and, and be the mortgage holder so what we're gonna the, the idea that we're being creative here in this episode is almost the same idea, um, but it's taking it one step further. So let's say let's say the mortgage maybe your mortgage was too high, you know, or or maybe your mortgage was you know you're not in that position to, for yourself. But another option for this family member who you want to help out um, could be in the same realm, but not buying, not helping you buy your home, but helping you get started in buying a, your first real estate property, your investment property, mm. or maybe, or maybe it's a, uh, you know, not be your first one. Maybe it's another one down the line, but instead the idea is that the, the parent could say, take this lump sum of money that they have access to. And they're like, you know what? I still want my passive income. I still want this regular income coming in off this money. You know, I've been used to getting this already and I would re- like to continue that because that's all I really need. I and mean, this money eventually would get passed down the line anyway. So mm-hmm. maybe instead of us buying or buying a mortgage on your home, maybe we go out and we find a real estate rental property and we put that property uh, in your name. So the, the let's say it was you, Kyle, that we put this property in your name and then that family member uh, passes you, say, this mortgage and pays the mortgage. And uh, now that this property is in your name and they're going to be promised, I think what we were, we were thinking about creatively is like since they just want this person was really just wanting some income, right, then maybe we can set this deal up in a way that they get the cash flow off this rental property. And you, even though you're owning the rental property, eventually, I think your benefit in this case is you are on the deed. This is your rental pro- mm-hmm. you know, rental property. Um, you're not getting any monthly cash flow, but uh, you're getting that appreciation. And eventually, that, that, that rental property will be passed to you. So it's like passing the money down the line, but you've started this machine early. Yeah, I want to reiterate. Yeah, let's let's go back over it. because a lot of people. I remember the first time I brought this idea up to you, John. You, it, it was almost like when you say it, what you hear is what your brain defaults to hearing. So it was like you know, in your, I remember this vividly because I had to repeat it a couple times, and then you were like, "Oh, I see what you're saying now." Because we were chatting about this just in our own experiences, and. We were discussing this and I, I brought this idea up to you and you said back to me, you said, oh, so the parent would buy the rental property and you'd manage the property and then eventually you would be, you know, you'd inherit this property. And that was sort of like the initial interpretation because, and that makes sense, right? Like when you think about that, you well, it's their money. So they're buying the investment property and then they're going to essentially benefit from this and then you'll eventually benefit down the road and what what's wrong about right. that or i guess what isn't helpful about that is two things the first one is and i i know this about my own experience and my parents are you know i've spoken uh, about them on earlier episodes they are they were very like i'll call it good with their money you know they did they didn't buy unnecessary things they're also pretty conservative when it comes to their investing style so just the thought that they would own an investment property is very sort of like stressful. It's like triggering. It's like, even if you like want to say, no, we'll take care of everything. Like for them, it'd be like, nope, it's, it's tied to our name. 
our name is on it, that would be a concern for them. And that might, may or may not be true for you, friends. But the other thing, instead of them having the title, meaning their names are on this property, by having it in the children's name, mm -hmm. the benefit that happens there is that you do not have a capital gains tax upon that time when they move on to the mm -hmm. next life. So there is that benefit, of course, which is like making sure that it's in their name. But then the other piece too is that they're like free and clear and they don't actually own the property. They hold the mortgage mm -hmm. to the property mm -hmm. in the same way that you would hold the mortgage if they were to say pay off your personal mortgage right. that we discussed right. in the last episode. So same idea, except we've got a new property coming in and all of a sudden you now own this property they hold a mortgage on it. And of course you would have to figure out like what makes sense for them. I know for me, I've had this discussion. Um, we haven't done anything about this discussion, um, you know, in my particular family or scenario, but we've been going down this rabbit hole and we've been talking about it. And more and more, you know, my, my parents are sort of like, wow, that actually makes a lot of sense. And, and in our case, we're like, we're totally fine for you to just take all the cash flow, if anything goes wrong with the property, like we'll handle it, we'll deal with it, we'll even pay out of pocket for it so that there's right. no thought of you having to worry about for them it's, anything. Right. For them it's and then just it's like it's hands off, just right. cash flow. And they're gonna get a great cash flow too. Like it's like it's not about us maximizing cash flow. It's we don't want any cash flow. We just are happy that, hey, they're getting cash flow. And instead of them say investing in like you know, in some sort of mutual fund or whatever. Right, exactly. First of all, they would have a hard time generating that same amount of cash flow. The benefit, the bank gets the benefit over there and they get the cash flow, which is good for them. But now it's like, wait a second, if we do it this way, they get more cash flow and there's going to be a benefit on our end as well. So once again, it's like instead of only getting one way for your entire family wealth, to grow, you now have two ways. So you're keeping that money in the family and you're making that money work within the family. And right. I'll be honest and say that many parents, when you have a good enough relationship that you're actually having conversations like this, if that's the case, then they're going to like be like, wow, they're going to feel like a sense of pride that they're able to provide right. a better opportunity for the future generations. Yeah. And I think I think Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong here. Like when we, this particular scenario, this is a scenario where the, this family or, or let's say, you know, it's one of our family members and, and they have, they have access to this capital that's going to help buy this home outright, right? Because that's going to allow them to get the cash flow that gets a return on their money in the best case scenario. So they, they're all of a sudden, they're going to, they're going to say, you're going to buy the property. They're the mortgage holder. You're paying them all the cash flow on this rental property, and that's going to look good for them because maybe, like, you know, if I put it over here, I would get, you know, five, six, seven percent. I'm going to hope to get that here or more so, right? So, um, this is this is a scenario where if this is your family, this is not probably a case where like that person needs access to that money, right? Like like the actual mm. lump sum of money, right? Like let's say the house. We, I think the example we used yes uh, last time uh, when we talked about this to pay off the mortgage or or to uh, lend you the mortgage and they're the mortgage holder was like a hundred thousand dollars. So let's say this 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 family member has access to that kind of money and they help you buy this rental property. If they needed access to that hundred thousand dollars, I don't think this is a scenario for them because maybe they're, totally. they're, they're thinking I need that to live. I can't give you my hundred thousand dollars cause you're going to buy a rental property and then, and then give me the cash flow. But maybe I need to eat into that, that hundred thousand dollars. Eventually, if that's the case, this is not the scenario for you because that, money is going to be locked in that property and we're thinking long term and that money would be passed. So, right Kyle, we're not we're not thinking that we're we're making sure that this is not the scenario where that 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 family member is going to need that money to live. Absolutely. You definitely do not <laughs> right. want to be the cause of any stress. Right. Uh, for, you know, I mean, and this would be in a, in a joint venture as well. You know, we always have the conversation right. with How joint long? venture or potential joint venture agreement um, um, participants to say, 
you know, like based on what you're saying, this doesn't seem like a good fit for you because the amount seems a little too high where now you're going to be a little tight. We don't want that for you. We certainly don't want anybody, you know, every week breathing down our back either saying like, hey, uh, you know, how's the cash flow of this? You know, how is everything working out? Right. Is there any problems? You know, you want it. You want them to know it's like, OK, we're, this is this is going to be something that's longer term. But one thing that could be really beneficial is where they do have some cash. They don't necessarily need it right now, but they're thinking over the long run, like if I just keep using this money, because what ends up happening in a lot of cases when people get into retirement mode, first of all, not only do financial advisors, all planners would suggest that you want to have less risk, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So that means less reward. What sometimes happens is they almost get to something where it's almost so low that now it's like you're just living off of almost cash, which can be, uh, and, and sometimes it's, it's the actual people that want that, that they're like, I don't want to see the number going up and down like it did on the way to get right. to this place. Because what if I need, like, I, I don't have the same income. I have, a, I'm living on a pension. Maybe they don't even have a pension. They're living off of this nest egg. So they want it to be as like secure as possible. But then they're looking at it going, well, if we keep on spending this amount of money every year, like you can quickly do the math in 10 years, I'm going to have this much left. And in, you know, 20 years, if I'm lucky enough to be alive in 20 years, I'm going to have this much left. And that's not enough given my current lifestyle, not to mention maybe they wanted to do a few other things. So now it's like, well, how do we take some of that nest egg? How do we make sure that we're giving them some cash flow without huge fluctuations? So again, is this a good idea if let's say you, the, the person I'm going to say the, we'll, we'll call it the child in the relationship who is maybe middle age, like if you don't have a steady enough income to ensure that, hey, what if you what if you get a tenant in there and the tenant doesn't pay the rent? Are you able to for a few months, maybe even 10 months, are you able to continue giving your parents or the in-laws or the whoever, whatever relative, are you able to sustain that just in case? Because you don't want them to now be put in a lurch nope. because something happened over here. So you also need to make sure that you've got your budget organized and that you're like, okay, I do have access to maybe a home equity line of credit so that if things didn't go well for three, four or five months, that we can make sure this works and sustains itself for sure. until we get over this rough patch. Because again, we're in this for the long term. Well, now, another piece, John, I wanted to mention is you could also have an agreement where maybe it's like on a shorter term and you say, well, Maybe it's like for five years, we're going to aim to do this for five years. And then in five years, we are anticipating or we are hoping that we will be able to get a 70 or 80% loan to value mortgage through the bank mm -hmm. if you no longer want to do this arrangement. So it, it doesn't have to be forever right. for, you know, for the, the parents or relatives. It could be on a shorter term. Um, but I would argue that that might be something you say, well, in five years, let's sit down and let's discuss right. where we are. And that might mean uh, you trying to get a mortgage traditionally if they just don't like the arrangement, right? Hopefully they've been, you've you've kept up your word and, and they've received all of their payments. Maybe they're going to be like, I'm ready to just keep sailing off into the sunset. That's kind of the goal is that they're winning to the point where they want to keep going. But at least it's like you can put something down on paper where you say, listen, just like a joint venture, we're going to sit down and we're going to come to some sort of agreement. And let's say if you're not liking it, then we can look to other means. Mm -hmm. Or if the property didn't appreciate as we anticipated it would have by now, maybe, or maybe my financial situation you know, doesn't call for it, then maybe we look to potentially sell mm -hmm. the property. But mm -hmm. ultimately at the end of the day, you know, if it is a long-term play and you've set it up so that everyone's winning, you'll probably get to a place where they're going, I mean, unless they're that much more courageous by that point, they might say like, this is the, easiest way that I've ever, you know, sort of managed right. this particular part of my nest egg. Yeah. And I think, I think a big idea, what I just heard you say in two different ways is that you have to treat this family member who's holding your mortgage like the bank. Like you have to treat it like a business. You can't just say like, oh, we're going to get into this. And then sometimes like, as, you know, you're the mortgage holder 
and oh, I didn't get my rent this week. So uh, guys, your your cash flow is going to be a little low. Um, then you know, like you can't do that to the bank. The bank's going to say, "Where's my where's my mortgage payment?" So like normally, when you get into real estate investing, you have to, to talk about you know you have to plan for this. You have to you have to budget for vacancy. You have to think about what's going to happen. Can I meet that need if if that happens? You normally have to do that when you get into this line of business anyway. And then the other thing is like when you get into you know doing a mortgage, that's what the bank does, right? They're like, look, we're going to set a five-year term because we're going to renegotiate in five years and see where we're all at. In yeah. five years, you're going to be like, maybe I'll pay the whole thing off or maybe not. But you can do the exact same thing with your parents. So treat them like it's a business. Treat them like they're the actual mortgage holder. Um, and I think I think that you can kind of erase some of those kind of wishy-washy things that it might sound like because it's a family member or somebody you, you know and, and trust. Um Kyle, I, I was going to bring up, um, say, an, another another question here about this kind of scenario that that I think like when when you go to buy your you know your rental property and they're the mortgage holder, they might you know I, I know that they don't they you by you owning the property it's almost eliminated their risk because you're now guaranteeing them to get their cash flow. Um, mm -hmm. Now now you being the now the 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 owner of this property, I've got kind of like two wonders here. One, one wonder here is that, that now I, you have, uh, this property bought outright. Uh, let's say, let's say it was a scenario where they bought the property outright. There's no mortgage and that helps them get the cash flow that they need. Um, is there, there now this goes to I th probably like any risk factor when you are buying a property. Mm -hmm. Like if you were buying this rental property outright, the risk here, right, is that you paid a whack load of money to buy a property. You did not leverage any money. Like you didn't go to the bank and say, I'm only going to put in this much on my, my property. I put in all of it. So now I've put like all my all my eggs in one basket in a sense instead of leveraging some money and going like uh, on one property. So like there's a risk factor there, but but that's, that's true if you bought it outright yourself anyway. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts there? It's like, is there, is there a way for us to like mitigate that risk? Can that be helpful mm -hmm. to like, I know that they're lending you the money to buy the property, but maybe splitting that up uh, or, or coming up with a better scenario to kind of limit your risk of saying, look, I'm going to put, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars of, of money here. And then, and then we not like, Ooh, what happens if that property forecloses or something happens to the land yeah. or, you know, you never know. Totally, totally. And, and if this is a new property purchase, which I'm, I'm guessing that that, you know, anyone who's listening to this and going like, wow, this is like uh, uh, a wonder we never considered or a possibility we never considered. Number one thing we've heard so far since the beginning of this podcast is people saying, I'm just like, I don't have enough capital ready. So like they are now saving, which is great. Um, they don't, maybe they, they don't have access to like getting a mortgage because maybe they are self-employed or maybe their income just doesn't allow for it because they have a mortgage and they have other obligations. So typically, you know, I'm anticipating that this would be a property that you're going out and purchasing. You don't already own. Um, and you're, that means you're going to have to go to the lawyer, mm -hmm. at least here in Ontario, here in Canada, and in some parts of the U S uh, that might just be a, a notary and, and other means. But the reality is like, if you're already going to the lawyer, you're going to want to actually have a formal mortgage drafted up. So when you talk about risk, the reality is, is that regardless of how much money the, you know, the, um, the relative, the parent, the whoever, who is going to go in on this with you, they now hold a mortgage, which essentially says that if you don't follow through, like you had said, John, like you have to treat it like the bank. They yep. are the bank. They truly are the bank. That's right. Especially if you do it the right way. You're already going to the lawyer to sign off on the closing documents for title. Get a legit mortgage you know, a charge, they call it, put on the property so that they are truly, in fact, able to take that property back from you, right? Right. Which I know seems like, well, wait, like we're family, we're this. Right, right, it's right, like, right, well, right. I mean, hey, if there's no issue, just do it. And then that way you don't have to worry about anything. If a divorce happens, if a, right. you just never know like what could possibly happen in life. It's just easy to know exactly what would happen if something like that were to take place. Now, on the other hand, you had also mentioned is like, you know, there there is some risk because it's like, hey, um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it is putting 
and I would hope it's not all their eggs in one basket, but you're right. Like, you know, it feels that way, right? Like they're taking a chunk of their nest egg, they're putting it all on this property. And that means one of two things. One thing is that the they are the primary mortgage holder. Mm-hmm. So that means mm-hmm. that they have first rights to take the property back if there was any sort of you know disagreement, if the fam you know, there was a family rift, something happened and you know, let's say there was a fight or you know, whatever, a falling out. It's like if you don't follow through with the agreement, then they could legally take the property back just like a bank would, right? right. For closure or a power of sale here in Ontario and in Canada. So there is that safety there. Now, what I think I heard you sort of asking about was like, well, maybe are there some other options? I would say the next option that you could have is say, hey, listen, if you, you know, if you're looking to put this property and maybe I'm the parent or a relative speaking to the person who wants to buy this property, um, I could say, I would like you to bring 10%. Or I'd like you to bring 20% because maybe the down payment isn't the issue for them. Maybe it's getting the mortgage that's the issue for them, right? So they could ask them to bring a down payment. And then that way, that way, basically, they're only putting a certain number of dollars invested. They're still the primary mortgage holder. Now, you could take it one more step and you could say, well, I'm only interested, John, in putting like paying for half of this property and having a mortgage on half the property. This reduces the amount of money or capital that the mortgage holder is going to put in. But if the buyer is going to another lender in order to get the rest of the property paid for, what you're going to have is you're actually going to have two mortgages Yep. and how this works. So in one way, you're only putting up half the capital. So that part's nice, but you've actually increased your risk just a bit because it's most likely if you go to a, you know, a, a typical big bank, they're going to make sure that they have the first mortgage and your relative is going to then be the second mm. mortgage holder, which means they are in front of you in line, right? To right. get their order, let's say. If right. the payments stop, they get first dibs, and then the second mortgage holder gets their piece. So you have to, you know, if you do go that way, like, you know, and again, if you're getting, to me, I feel like there's a little bit of, like if it's a risk issue that, as to why you're doing that, I don't know if you're actually managing your risk. You're just reducing the amount of money you're putting in. But I would argue your risk is actually increased Mm -hmm. because you Mm -hmm. have a higher chance of losing that money because the first bank might fire sale the place and you may or may not get your, you know, your cut. So I almost feel like having a full mortgage or making the buyer have, you know, 10, 15, whatever percentage, so that there's a little bit of, you know, skin in the game there for them. And then them doing the remainder. I feel like that's the safe part from a maintaining ownership of the property Mm -hmm. so that it's like you get the property. That might make some people feel and sleep better at night than say having somebody else ahead of them in line that gets to sort of, you know, take their piece. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good a good idea. Uh, uh, you know, an item to consider when when going down this this uh, kind of this pathway. Um, another um, another thought I had, um, which is a benefit to you, the owner of the property, um, is is if your family member paid off this in full, is now you have access. Think about now you have access to all the equity built into the home. So, so you, you essentially have, could take out a home equity line of credit on that home and go and use that, you know, to buy another property and then make sure all the numbers work. So it's like you are building this system, uh, a machine that can help you generate your wealth, um, while at the same time, you know, making everybody have a win-win your, your family member is getting what they need in, in this scenario. Um, they feel secure. Uh, you're starting, you know, a system to build up your wealth. You're feeling secure. You're feeling happy. Everybody's getting a win-win out of this idea. Yeah. And, and you know, the, I guess the last piece, too, when you think about, like, in the long term, you know, what this does from a family wealth perspective is just being able to, um, you know, know that that capital is now being you know that wealth is now being generated in the next generation right so now they're building that equity you were just talking about 
And there's also, again, upon death, this something that, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, when when parents or relatives are getting older, they start to think about these things and they're like, okay, I'm going to pass down some of this here. But sometimes they forget that some of their investments, um, they haven't been taxed. So the capital gains piece has not happened yet. So if they were to purchase that property in their own name, upon death, there's now another capital of uh, capital gains um, tax event right. triggered where they'll have to pay it. Whereas in this scenario, one benefit is now the next generation owns the actual asset, you can actually have that stipulation where basically that mortgage upon death would actually be forgiven. Right. And the beauty is, is that because it's cash that they actually lent in the first place, cash, there is no capital gain there, right? It's just going to pass down and it's not going to be taxed because it was already taxed. It either was earned as income at yep. some point yep. or it was earned as investment income. And you so pay the capital gains. out of an RRSP yep. or you know a 401k if you're in the US or an IRA or whatever it was. It came out, if it was an unregistered investment that you're liquidating, that's the tax event when you liquidate. Mm -hmm. And now it's cash and that cash can be gifted as you see fit. So of course, if, if, Hey, if they're up for you, just being gifted the money, then you don't have to have a mortgage at all. But wouldn't it be great if you could feel great about bringing an idea that's going to help them with their lifestyle and their cash flow, while you're also helping your own generation as well as probably if, if you have children, you're probably thinking ahead to them as well. Cause you're like, I want to build something for them, but I just don't have the means to do it right now this is a great, at least a great thought that you can have one other creative idea of how you might start to generate that wealth. Uh, awesome stuff there, Kyle. Awesome stuff. And I think we've given some, some great you know, new creative ideas that extended on our last episode's creative ideas. And if you are looking to get into real estate investing um, and are sure exactly, you know, how to take the next step or, or, it, you know, it sounds risky and you want some guidance along that next step. Um, that's what, that's what we do. We, we help, we help people just like you get started in real estate. We partner with each other, um, to make sure that you are feeling comfortable in the situation so that, uh, uh, you can start to build your wealth. So we are always growing our list of potential joint ventures or JVs. Um, you can quickly head on over to uh, investedteacher.com forward slash JV. There's a form there to fill out. And if you're interested in partnering with us on your next or your first rental property, um, you can fill out that form and join the list there so that when we come across a deal, we can reach out to you. I love it. I love it. And John, uh, you know, people are being so kind. Those who are taking a, just a moment to make sure that you leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Even a one-liner goes a long way to ensure that the algorithm says, you know what, there's something to mm. share here and uh, let's get that information out. Remember, it's an abundance mindset that we have here at Invested Teacher. We want you to think about the same thing. So help others in your social circle to start thinking differently. Maybe they found today's episode really helpful and it applies to them. Maybe this episode actually doesn't apply to them because maybe they're not in a situation where this even makes any sense. But right. one thing I will tell you is that we're gonna keep striving to find ways that you and your closest family can benefit and can start thinking about how you can generate wealth. There's not one way to do it. There are so many different ways and so many different contexts. And if we can be a part of that, we would love it. So let us be a part of it for other people. Like I said, rating and review, huge, huge help to us. And uh, we can't wait to see you in the next episode. All links, resources, and transcripts from this episode um, can be found over at uh, investedteacher.com forward slash episode 19. Again, that's investedteacher.com forward slash episode 19. All right, invested students, class dismissed. Just a reminder, the content is for all informational purposes only you should not construe any such information or other material as legal tax investment financial or other advice